You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. Cued up for your listening pleasure is the wild story of the sterilization of Ann Cooper Hewitt, which I first recorded and released back on April 5th of 2010. Now, one thing that I wasn't doing in these early stories was adjusting the monetary values to modern numbers, so I'm just going to do that right now. In the story, I mentioned that Peter Cooper Hewitt left an estate valued at $10 million in 1921. Adjusted for inflation, that would be about $170 million today. Now, daughter Anne initially received an allowance of $1,000 per month. That would be about $17,000 per month or $204,000 per year today. Wow. But believe it or not, that was later up to $35,000 per year, which is just shy of $600,000 per year today. It must have been really tough for a kid to live on so little money, don't you think? I don't know about you, but I'm suddenly feeling quite poor. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side history. My name is Steve Silverman. Today's story is on the sterilization of Ann Cooper Hewitt. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. For today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you about your computer keyboard. And yes, there's still some people using the old-fashioned typewriters, but that uh, those people are far and few between. Anyway, that is known as the QWERTY keyboard, as I'm sure you know. It spells Q-W-E-R-T-Y across the top row of letters. Now, this version of the keyboard was introduced in 1873 by Remington Arms to sell its typewriters. And it was purposely laid out in a certain way so that it would spell one particular 10-letter word across the QWERTY row. So across the top row of letters, you could spell one particular 10 letter word. So my question for you today is, what was that 10 letter word that you can spell across the top row of keys? Again, what is that 10 letter word that you can spell across the top row of keys? And I'll leave you in suspense until the end of this podcast. And now for today's story on the sterilization of Anne Cooper Hewitt, a woman who was just born into extreme wealth and somehow managed to grab the headlines practically from the day she was born until the very day she died and even beyond. Now, Anne's dad was a guy named Peter Cooper Hewitt, and he was a self-made millionaire, basically an engineer who had numerous inventions, including the mercury arc lamp. That was his most important invention, which was a precursor to the uh, modern fluorescent lights. This is a very, very important invention's day because incandescent bulbs were very expensive to operate, and the mercury arc lamp allowed industry to provide lighting for a much lower cost. Now, his father was Abram Hewitt, who was once the mayor of New York City, and his grandfather was the famous Peter Cooper, the wealthy industrialist who built the first U.S. locomotive, the Tom Thumb, founded the Cooper Union School in New York City, which is something that I've always been very interested in. And more importantly, this is probably the most important thing, he invented instant gelatin, and he sold the company off, and it became Jell-O, even though he didn't make much money from it. Now, her mom, Ann Cooper's mom, was Marion Andrews, who was reportedly from a southern, you know, aristocratic family, but of only minor wealth and prominence in society. And what I should mention is that she had been married twice before meeting Peter Cooper Hewitt. So this was her third marriage that produced Ann Cooper Hewitt. Ann's dad was much, much older than mom and died on August 25th, 1921. And that's really where the story gets going because his estate in 1921 was estimated around $10 million in value. And that's a combination of the money he earned from his inventions as well as the large trust fund that his uh, grandfather had set up for him. Now, his will specified that the bulk of this fortune was to be equally split between his wife, Marion, and his daughter, Anne. And if mom remarried, her share would be cut in half and go to Anne. Dad specifically set up $1,000 per month uh, for the upbringing of Anne until she was, uh, you know, of age, which back then was 21 years of age. If for some crazy reason Anne died childless, all the money would then revert back to her mom, Marion, if she was still alive. And this will actually be very important later on in the story. Anne's name first started appearing in the papers in 1922, that's shortly after her father's death. 
And this is because her mother petitioned the courts for an increase in her allowance. She felt that Anne could not live off of $1,000 per month. The court actually agreed and increased Anne's allowance to $35,000 per year. That's an increase of $23,000 per year back in 1922. Of course, when you're dealing with this kind of money, someone's going to object. And in this case, it was Peter Cooper Hewitt's brothers and sisters. And they argued that Anne was illegitimate and she was not entitled to a penny. She shouldn't even gotten $1,000 per month. And this is because Anne was born four years prior to the couple's marriage in 1918. So the family was attempting to prove that this marriage was totally illegal and that Anne was nothing more than a so-called love child. The case was filed in the court by the trustees of the fund established in Peter Cooper's will, that's the grandfather, for his grandson, Peter Cooper Hewitt. And they basically wanted the court to determine if Anne and her mom, Marion, were in fact the legal heirs to his estate, you know, and finally settle the case once and for all. Now, what proof did the family have of this so-called illegal marriage? Well, it turns out, as I mentioned earlier, mom had, been, mom had been married twice before she married Peter Cooper Hewitt. And her first husband was a wealthy Californian. I'm going to mess up his name, I'm sure. It was Dr. Pedar de Brugier, from whom she got a quickie divorce in Reno. Which leads us to husband number two, a wealthy Wall Street guy named Stuart Denning. And Denning was able to get that marriage annulled in 1910 on the grounds that there was something fishy about that divorce from De Brugier. Now, if his claim about that Reno divorce was true, then, there was, then she was still technically married to her first husband, De Brugier. And of course, that meant that her marriage to Hewitt was illegal, and that also meant no money for her or her daughter Anne. She was still technically married to the first husband. At least that's what they were trying to prove. Now, while the courts were trying to straighten out this tangled matrimonial mess, she didn't waste any time. She found husband number four, and she was courted by a number of men, but she narrowed it down to two, and that was the Baron Robert de Erlinger and the Shah of Persia, which is, of course, known as Iran today. The Shah of Persia actually wanted her to head his harem, and Marion opted to become a baroness. She chose the first person, and uh, she was actually known as a baroness in the news for a number of years after that. Before we get back to the court case, I should also mention that by the end of 1926, Mom had also divorced the Baron uh, because supposedly he admired other women, if you know what I mean. Then Marion married once again to husband number five, who was a prominent New Jersey lawyer named George McCarter. And on the marriage certificate, it said that she was 39 years old at the time, but from what I can figure, she was actually 42. And as you can probably guess, that one ended in divorce also. So let's get back to the question of who would receive Peter Cooper Hewitt's fortune. On May 1st, 1925, the court ruled in favor of Anne and her mom. The decision, of course, was appealed by the family, but on January 5th, 1927, the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court affirmed the decision without opinion. That meant that Anne Cooper really was the daughter of Peter Cooper Hewitt, and she was entitled to everything that both her father and grandfather's estate set forth. As you can imagine, this was quite the sensational story in its day, with both Mom Marion and daughter Anne becoming minor celebrities, kind of like, you know, the Paris Hiltons of today. Yet this was absolutely nothing compared to the scandalous trial that was about to come. It was one that was so shocking that it would shake the very foundation of America's high society. You see, in January of 1936, Ann Cooper Hewitt, who is now 21 years old, sued her mother and two doctors for $500,000 for duping her into becoming sterilized. And you're probably wondering, how can you trick an adult into being sterilized? Well, the first thing you need to do, back, at least back then, the first thing you need to do was get a doctor to show that you or someone else was mentally deficient. And mom was able to accomplish his task by taking Anne to see a state psychologist in San Francisco on August 14, 1934. These mental tests showed that uh, Anne, who was 20 at the time, only had a mental age of 11 and was so-called, you know, in quotes, feeble-minded. It didn't matter that there were previous tests in New Jersey that had found Anne to be fine. The mother now had a doctor who said her daughter uh, was not really, you know, that bright. Next, you need to trick the person into actually getting the surgery. 
So four days after the mental exam, Anne was taken to San Francisco's Dante Sanatorium, apparently suffering from appendicitis. And on the recommendation of mom's physician and at the mother's request, the decision was made to have Anne sterilized at the same time. Not only would she get her appendix removed, but she would be sterilized. Now, while Anne had no knowledge of this being done at the time, they, they really had no problem, and get this, they had no problem billing her portion of the estate for the $9,000 medical bill. Mom wasn't paying for it. Anne was paying for her own sterilization. Now, how Anne came to learn that she'd been duped was never, ever revealed. But it's important to note that the alleged sterilization occurred 11 months before she was to turn 21 and be free to marry. This was perceived as a way for the mother, Marion, to gain tighter control over Anne's portion of the estate. Remember what the dad's will said. If Anne died childless, mom would get everything. The press had a field day with this one, and the war of words began between the two sides. Anne accused her mother of neglect and abuse. That's, you know, pretty obvious here. She labeled her mother as an adventuress who had multiple husbands and many other lovers. She partied hard, drank heavily and supposedly squandered away a portion of Anne's fortune in gambling and high living. She also claimed that her mother locked her up, deprived her of a proper education, never allowed her to have friends, never allowed her to have boyfriends. And it was also brought to light that mom was not from the Southern aristocracy that she had so long claimed to be. Instead, Marion was supposedly the daughter of a poor horse cab driver in San Francisco. Now, mom and her team of lawyers fired back that all of these accusations were just totally false. That is, except for the sterilization. She claimed that she had lavished her daughter in a life of luxury, and and the proof of this was that she fought tooth and nail to establish her daughter's legitimacy so so that Anne could get her rightful chunk of her dad's estate. And she also said that Anne was supposedly sent to the best schools, but had been thrown out for various scandalous reasons, although those scandalous reasons were never clearly defined. Marion also said, and this quote is pretty troubling, and that Anne is a moron running around with morons, and this was done to prevent the birth of a lot of moronic children. Ouch, that one really hurts. But then things really turned sour as if they couldn't get any worse. The police got involved. Mom and the two doctors were arrested and then released on bail. All three were charged with mayhem, which at the time was defined under California law as anyone who, and I quote this, unlawfully and maliciously deprives a human being of a member of his body or disables, disfigures, or renders it useless. That's the end of the quote. And I would say that sterilization definitely falls under this description. The penalty, if found guilty for mom and the two doctors, was 1 to 14 years imprisonment. But the case never got that far. The various lawsuits, as you would expect, were settled out of court. The two doctors were placed on trial, but the judge ultimately dismissed the charges against them for lack of evidence. You see, in the eyes of the law, Anne was still a minor, and therefore her mother had the right to act in what she felt was the best interest of her daughter. Mom, on the other hand, never made it to trial. Due to the notoriety of the case, she went into hiding. And, of course, a warrant was issued for her arrest, and she was located a week later in a New Jersey hospital recovering from an attempted suicide. Anne ultimately refused to testify against her mother, and the charges were dropped. I guess it's one thing to sue your mom for money, but it's a whole different animal when you try to put her in jail. Sadly, the next time Marion would make the uh, newspapers would be in 1939 when she died at age 55, alone, broke, and living in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City. As you would expect, her and her, you know, Anne and her mom were not on speaking terms, but Anne did manage to go to the funeral. Anne, on the other hand, managed to make the headlines over and over and over again after the sensational trial uh, ended. You see, she married, then she married again, and then again, and again, and again, and again. If you counted that, that was six times in total, although uh, husbands number four and six were the same man. Unlike her mom, however, she did not marry rich men. They were the complete opposite. She married a garage foreman, a bar steward, a miner, a cowboy, and a disc jockey. It was her fourth marriage to disc jockey Frank Rodeo Roy Nicholson that allowed Anne to grab the front page headlines 
once again. You see, on the eve of their elopement in 1947, Nicholson's first wife agreed to grant him a divorce, and she was found several hours later dead from an overdose. Now, Nicholson admitted that he was sitting outside her house in his car while the body was taken away in an ambulance, but he claimed he had nothing to do with it. Now, although never explicitly stated in the press, the articles were written in such a way to suggest that the couple bumped off the first Mrs. Nicholson so that they can get married. Two weeks later, her death was in fact determined to be a suicide, but the newlyweds found themselves in further legal hot water. That's because the couple was charged with criminal conspiracy in an attempt to bypass California's premarital blood test law. That's the test with syphilis, and they were placed on trial as a result. The jury, you know, they couldn't reach a verdict, but it was later determined that they had given false testimony on the witness stand. So a second trial was held, and both the husband and the wife, Anne and her husband, Rodeo Roy, were convicted of perjury. Their fine, which was really no big deal to a millionaire, was $1,000. Now, two years after the trial ended, and of course we know that uh, she divorced Rodeo Roy, married somebody else, then remarried Rodeo Roy, Rodeo Roy announced to the press that his wife, Anne, was running for the U.S. Senate seat in Nevada, and here's another quote, to fight communism and help fix things up for the kids. That's the end of the quote. Now, this wasn't just an odd announcement because Anne was supposedly mentally deficient, but also Rodeo Roy said in his statement that he would manage his wife's campaign on the Republican ticket, but there's no way he would ever vote for her. That's because he was a lifelong Democrat and had he felt obligated to vote for the Democratic candidate. Needless to say, her campaign never went much further than grabbing the headlines. In 1956, at the age of 40 years, Anne died from cancer. Her entire fortune was left to her husband, Rodeo Roy, who died a little over one year later. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. Well, you lost the big money, but you won $170 in cash, plus $100 for saying the secret word. Congratulations and thanks to both of you. You Bet Your Life is a John Goodell production transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith, music by Jerry Fielding. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, You Bet Your Life, presented by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And don't forget, next week the big question will be worth $2,000. Folks, be sure to see the article about Groucho and You Bet Your Life in the current issue of Look Magazine. Well, Crosby's waiting in the wings, so good night, folks. And remember, just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Folks, here's a tip from the National Safety Council. Good drivers don't brag about their ability to get out of tight spots. They stay out of them. This is George Fenneman, signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. That is from the March 22, 1950 radio broadcast of Groucho Marx's You Bet Your Life. Shortly before they uh, put it on TV, it was actually broadcast on radio and TV at the same time. And I have to tell you, I love to stay up and watch a TV version in high schools, in reruns, of course. Uh, and I would stay up till, you know, 2, 3 in the morning to watch it on Channel 11 in New York City. The sponsor, DeSoto, was named after the famed Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto. Walter Chrysler introduced the line in 1928 as a mid-priced automobile that was designed to compete with the similar offerings by GM, Studer Baker, and uh, his other competitors. The 1958 recession caused the sales of DeSotos to come to a screeching halt, and Chrysler officially discontinued the line on November 30th, 1960. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. 
It's time for I to call news of the weird past. Our first tidbit goes back to December 30th, 1913, which reported that Isaac Bishop of Eagle Township in Ohio was loading his clay pipe with tobacco after a very fine meal that his wife had prepared. Now, the lights were kind of dim. He's reclining in his chair, and he didn't notice that not only did he load tobacco, but he also loaded a 32 caliber cartridge into his pipe. He then brought the match to the pipe, and of course, the bullet went off and went through his cheek. He ended up with a scar on his left cheek for the rest of his life. Our second tidbit is from March 22nd, 1932, and takes place in Jackson, Michigan. It's reported that a trooper named Leon Hopkins was opening his mail at the local post office when a guy named Joe Bronkovich complained to him that his wife ran off with another man. Just at that moment, a flyer fell out of the trooper's mail with Bronkovich's picture on it. He was arrested immediately for escaping from the Missouri State Prison on October 2nd, 1926. Now, Bronkovich really didn't have much uh, right to complain to the officer about his wife running off because it turns out that he was serving time for bigamy. Our last little tidbit for today takes place on April 23rd, 1938 in Denver, Colorado, where it's reported that a boy named Ray Fowler, who was 14 years old at the time, received a $300 prize for writing a story on his narrow escape from a railroad water tank. It seems that he and several other boys were swimming in the tank when a train drew out a large amount of the water. So now they could no longer reach the rim and they were stuck treading water. And they were there for a fairly long period of time. So Ray decided to dive down repeatedly and open a dump valve in the bottom of the tank. And and he didn't want to get sucked out, so he just opened the valve up a little bit, let some water out. And he kept doing that over and over again until the boys were able to stand on the bottom of the tank and be rescued. And now the answer to today's question of the day. And I asked about the QWERTY keyboard, the one that people love to hate, the one that's probably responsible for a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome. Anyway, this keyboard was modified into its form that you basically see today in 1873 by Remington Arms. I should tell you the QWERTY keyboard in general was laid out by a guy named Christopher Scholes in the late 1860s because he was trying to keep the most common keys. In those days, of course, on typewriters, keys came up and struck the paper, and he was trying to keep them from getting tangled up in each other. So when Remington adopted this, uh, they made some slight modifications, and they they purposely made it so that the top row of letters would spell one 10-letter word, and that was the word typewriter. They wanted their salesmen to go, be able to go out and show customers how fast you could type with a typewriter. So they would type typewriter very, very quickly using just those letters on the top row. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to today's story on the sterilization of Ann Cooper Hewitt, as well as our question of the day on the typewriter keys, listening to our retro sponsor uh, from DeSoto Automobiles, as well as the news of the weird past tidbits, uh, you know, the guy who blasts his cheek out with his pipe, uh, the unlucky bigamist, and of course, the boy's narrow escape from uh, the railroad water tank. If you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. Uh, They are Einstein's Refrigerator, and the second one is Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. And as I've said before, they're both written by me, Steve Silverman. Uh, They're available from your local bookseller online and, of course, from your local library. If for some crazy reason you'd like to uh, contact me, uh, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Or you can visit my website at uselessinformation.org. And lastly, as always, I'd appreciate it uh, if you could log into iTunes and leave some positive comments to help increase the number of listeners to this podcast. A lot of people have done that, and I'm really thankful. Again, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.